Uh, hello, we're looking for Eddie Clark. This is Dustin Wilmus from KMSU Radio in Minnesota. Uh, Hi, a... how you doing? I'm here. I'm here. Sorry, mate. I was just upstairs. I couldn't get to the phone in time. All right. I wasn't sure if that was uh, some kind of answering machine trick or what was going on. No, no, no. I was just up the stairs. I couldn't get to the phone quick enough. I always keep, you know, because I'm, uh, I was, so how are you doing? <laughs> good. How are you doing? Hey, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm real good. Sorry about that. I didn't mean to, uh, to throw you a curveball there. Oh, no problem. Uh, I'm here with my co-host, Tun. Hey there. How are you doing? Okay. We got some uh, questions for you if you if you got some time. I have indeed, mate. I have indeed. I'm looking forward to it. Excellent. Well, we'll start off and ask you uh, how you met up with the guys from Motorhead and started playing with them. Ah, oh, what the early days. Well, it's um, it's a bit of a story. Um, basically, I I, I ran into Phil. Um, I was I was sort of subsidising my music career by working uh, by labouring on a boat. I was making a boat for someone on a on the Thames, and uh, a friend of mine came along and said, "Oh, I've got this friend of mine would like a job." And he introduced me to Phil Taylor. And, of course, you know, Phil, Phil and I got on really well. He told me he played the drums, and we talked about this and that. Uh, and then I didn't hear any more from Phil for a while. And um, he suddenly contacted me and said he joined Motorhead and said, look, we've done an album, but uh, Larry, the guitarist, the then guitarist, said, hey, I think um, we could use a second guitarist because of all the overdubs that were done in the studio, you know. And um, he said, I know this guy. He said, uh, why don't I give him a call? And of course, it was me. So he gave me a call, and I said, yeah, I'd love to do it, you know. Uh, and that was really how the the thing started off. But but I went to um, my audition, as it were, with the with the guys, and um, Larry was really really not that keen, I think, in, on being in Motorhead anymore. Um, so when I stepped in the frame, he kind of stepped out of the frame. So he left the way clear for me to, um, to for me to be the guitarist. You know, he sort of he sort of ducked out, and Lemmy and, and Phil and I just carried on as a three piece. Yeah, when you guys uh, were first on the scene, I mean, the kind of music that you guys were doing was really uh, different than anything anyone had ever heard before. Were you surprised that uh, you guys were so successful, or did you think that people well, were going to be scared? It, or? It, 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 well, at first, of course, it was quite difficult because people, as you say, they didn't know what to make of Motorhead. You know, there's a lot of people going, oh, we're the worst band in the world, and, you know, they just make a terrible noise, and, and one thing after another, you know. And of course, the first well, the first year was very difficult because we were trying to do something slightly different with Lemmy's style of bass playing. It it, it made the band sort of have a, a completely different sound. So, I I personally had to ad adapt quite quite serious of severely to 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 work with Lemmy's bass guitar. And and Phil Phil of course was playing more like Mitch Mitchell than anyone else I've ever come across. You know, because he was filling in and and doing all the all the fancy stuff, which which I thought Motorhead needed. I mean, it was something I thought. I thought the three of us really. By the after about twelve months, we kind of got it together, and we were starting to work together well. And it just got better and better for the, you know, after that first year, we just got better and better. And of course, leading up to the first album, which was unfortunately we didn't have any material for that record. Um, we had a couple of songs, but we redid a lot of the songs off the album that wasn't released by United Artists with Larry Wallace on it. But once we hit our stride with Overkill, and then we went on and did Bomber and Ace of Spades, we just went from strength to strength, you know. Yeah, what was it uh, like uh, those early days when you guys were touring? I mean, you guys have have had sort of a reputation of being a bit crazy. Was it just like nuts all the time, or? Yeah, we were nuts all the time, really. I mean, Phil and I used to fight all the time. He's a drummer, you know. You always fight with a drummer. <laughs> you know, we were always rolling around on the floor, punching each other, you know. Um, but, it, but it, well, it was crazy, you know, because, you know, we like to drink, you know, and uh, we used to stay up late a lot, you know, for many days at a time, you know, we liked a bit of amphetamine and and just generally lived the life, really, but it was a kind of, um, you know, I mean, I don't know whether Motorhead is a name for us, uh, an American name for Speed Freak, so uh, we kind of lived up to that, you know, uh, and of course with the booze as well, we were a pretty crazy trio, and um and it was just one of those sort of bands that people kind of started to like but weren't sure why, you know. Yeah. <laughs> it was one of those sort of things. <laughs> now, most uh, metal bands of today and even, you know, just uh, I guess even of recent years and everything, have, uh, they all kind of will say that they look up to you guys. What? How does that make you, you feel even now? I mean, Well, I think it's great. I mean, to have that sort of um, old granddad feel, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's quite good, really. I mean, because um, 
to think that you know a lot of these bands started thinking of Motorhead as their sort of mentors it, it's a it's a great compliment and um you know i feel that you know with that in mind that um i've been very fortunate you know my career has been you know hasn't made me as much money as i might have liked but you know it's made me it, it's made me well known it's it's uh, our songs are still played ace of spades has, has become a classic you know and as you say the bands that come through they always quote Motorhead as being one of their one of their main influences and um i don't think as a musician you can really ask for anything more you know, I mean, for me, as a kid, I would have, if you'd said I could have had that, I'd have taken it with both hands, you know. So there isn't ever any sort of, like, uh, professional jealousy or anything of, you know, bands like Metallica or these kind of groups uh, kind of surpass you as far as you were saying uh, financially? Does that bother you at all? Or Not at all, no. I mean, Lars used to come to a lot of our shows, you know, when he was a young kid. In fact, I remember having to throw him out of the dressing room once because we were trying to get dressed, you know. <laughs> I said, Lars, wait outside, will you, you know. Um, no, not at all. I mean, it's kind of the, the nature of the beast, isn't it? You know, you, you set the pace and then someone else comes along and, and has all the glory. You know, I, I think that's quite normal in, in any business, you know, in any sort of, well, entertainment business. You know, um, and as for the money, you know, I mean, money only brings heartache, really. You know, I mean, I've got enough. I'm comfortable. Um, I think the more money you have, the more problems you get, you know, and especially as a band. Our problems really started when we, the more famous we got, and then when we did get some money, that's when things started to go wrong, you know, because then it seems to matter more. But when you haven't got anything, you don't argue about anything because there's nothing really to argue about, you know. It's, um, yeah. You know what money's like. It, it kind of fucks everything up, you know. Well, can you touch on that a little bit? Uh, when you decided to leave Motorhead, what was the reasoning behind that? Well, the reason, well, I'll be honest with you, I never, ever thought I was going to leave Motorhead. I mean, Motorhead was, was my life, you know. Um, I certainly had no intention of leaving. It just, we were getting pretty famous. Um, by then, we were very big over here, you know. I mean, we couldn't walk down the street or anything. It was quite fantastic, really. Um, and we could sell out the Odeons, and our records did well. Although we had a bit of trouble with Iron Fist. It didn't go down as well as we would have liked. And uh, our management came up with this great idea of doing a single with Wendy O. Williams, uh, recording it in Canada, rehearsing in New York, and I was going to produce it, and Lemmy and Phil were going to play with the Plasmatics, and the record was going to be Stand By Your Man, which wasn't my favourite idea of a song. <laughs> I thought it was a bit silly myself, but um, I was going to produce it, and um, I went along with it because I know Phil and Lemmy really wanted to do it, Lemmy more than anyone. And, and so... Um, what happened was when we started recording it, I was, as I said, I was producing it. The engineer from um, Iron Fist, he flew over. And um, we had three days in the studio to do it. So the first day we laid the backing tracks down and they went down very well, even though I didn't like the arrangement of the song, to be honest. But anyway, I lived with it. And then we started singing with Wendy and, and Wendy was having a bit of trouble making the notes because it wasn't really her key. And it's not an easy song to sing. Uh, and I think they overlooked that, you know, because when they were rehearsing in New York, it sounded okay because you couldn't hear anything. <laughs> you know, but once we got in the studio, you could hear that it wasn't really working. Uh, uh, and then so I said to her on that day, on the first day, I said, look, Wendy, uh, what's your favorite key? And it turned out that she was about three octaves away from her favorite key. So I said, okay, we'll go and re-record the backing track and we'll do it again tomorrow. So we all went home, come back the next day, laid down the backing track again. Wendy started singing, it still, the song just wasn't working. The way they'd done the arrangement, it just wasn't singable like that. And I was getting so freaked out with it. And Lemmy was pushing me to get on with it. And I'm saying, look, Lemmy, it's, it, you know, we're having a bit of a few problems here. Uh, and in the end, I just said, look, I've got to go and have something to eat. I'll see you later. So, of course, I went out. We shut the session for a bit. But instead of going home, I'd, uh, going something where I went to the off-license, uh, to the liquor store and... Uh, I bought a bottle of Jack Daniels and went back to the hotel and got drunk because I just couldn't stand it anymore, you know, because it was sounding very bad to me. And I explained to the boys, I said, look, guys, we can't afford to do a record like this. It's too Mickey Mouse, you know. We're, we're, we're doing the reputation that we've worked so hard over six years to build up. We're going to ruin it with this with this song and this, this record. And they insisted that we... And I said, well, look, I don't want to do it. And they said, look, man, this is, this is an example of how much they wanted to do it. They said, we'll put on the cover... This has got nothing to do with Fast Eddie Clark. I said, look, it's not the point. The point is that Motorhead's my band as much as it is yours, and I don't think Motorhead should be doing it. And they insisted, and they went on and on and on, and I said, well, if that's your attitude, I said, I'll have to leave the band at the end of the tour. 
It was an American tour coming up. But really, it was only a threat to try and get them to see sense, you know. Well, of course, they said, all right, then, if that's how you feel, that's fine. So, um, hmm. so okay, so they went back in the studio and carried on recording this terrible record, and I, I just stayed at the hotel. Then we did a couple of shows in Canada, and then we went down to New York. Well, while we were coming down to New York, they were playing this bloody Wendy O. Williams plasmatics track of theirs that they were on in the, in the, in the bus, and it was awful. So I started to really lose my temper, and, um, and they were wearing plasmatic T-shirts and all that, just to rub my face in it, really, because they really thought it was funny, you know. So in the end, we got to the hotel in New York. We had a big meeting with the management, flew over, the record company flew over, and we had a big meeting, and, of course, we couldn't find any common ground. I was left isolated. I was on my own. I was the only one who seemed to think that this record was rubbish. Everybody else said it was great, and I said, well, if that's the case, then fuck it. I'm out of here. I'm gone. So I walked out. And then, of course, we, we had, um, there was a terrible scene there. There was a, I had a, one of the roadies started to lay into me. I had to knock him out, and then I had to go, go to another hotel. <laughs> but I wanted to do this show in New York. I said, well, let's do this show. We're here. All the equipment's here. So they finally agreed to do the show, but they said, we can only do the sound check. If, if you go into the building first and do your sound check, and then you go back to the hotel, and then we'll go in and do our sound check. So wow. I said, okay. I said, all right, I'll do that, because I wanted to do this show. It was at the Palladium, and it was really the, you know, it, it was the pinnacle of our plan in New York. It was, you know, it was quite, quite something. And we did the show, and, um, of course, the vibes on stage were, were marvellous. You know, we were, like, looking at each other with hate in our eyes, you know. It was all... But the gig went well, and um, I really enjoyed it, really. I enjoyed the playing, and, you know, I love the songs. I've always loved Motorhead, Red, you know. And... Um, so Nick Carris from DMA, he said to me after the show, he said, look, because I had a separate dressing room, of course, they put me in a little room on the side. And Nick Carris said to me, he said, look, why don't we go and talk to Phil and Emmy? I said, all right, I'll give it a go. So I went into the dressing room, there's like 200 people in there, all the smoke, you know, and all that. And they, they, it was a big dressing room, so they walked over to, they, Nick went and got them and brought them over to the door where I was standing. And I said, look, guys, that, that went really well. I said, look, let's carry on, shall we? Let's put all this behind us and just carry on. And they looked at me in the face and say, no man, fuck off, it's over. Well, what can you do when somebody says that? So um, people say that I left the band. Initially, I threw that in to try and get something happening, but um, in the end, they didn't want me anyway, so uh, so I got on a plane and came back to England, bandless, you know. Wow. And um, and that's where, you know, it's heartbreaking stuff. To be honest, it was heartbreaking. I remember kicking my heels around here in London on my own. I had a bottle of vodka in my pocket, and I was thinking... Well, wow. you know, I was in shock. You know, I wasn't in the band anymore. I'd, my rib had been my life for six and a half years, you know. And um, But that's the way it goes, isn't it? And um, what do you say after that? That was it, really. Yeah. Well, you guys are on good terms now, though, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. It didn't last that long. I mean, Phil was a bit awkward. Phil was the most awkward out of all of them. Um, Lemmy was good because I'd, I'd put Fastway together with Pete Way, and we were becoming quite a, quite a thing over here. And we did a... Uh, Twisted Sister album Pete produced and um, we were at Reading Festival and Twisted Sister said to Pete and I why don't we get up on and I played on the album their first album so we got up on stage Pete and I and and Lemmy jumped up on stage as well <laughs> so uh, we had to start talking after that you know what I mean yeah. so it was kind of good really I owe that one to Twisted Sister because I never wanted to fall out with them I mean it was never my you know I thought it was all very sad what happened you know so, and then Phil came round, and eventually, after about a year and a half, Phil started to talk to me again. He called me up and said, you know, man, sorry about this, and blah, 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 blah. And um, we kind of all got back to normal. But there's never any question of me going back with the band, because obviously they had Brian Robertson then, and I had Fastway. And sort of, and as the more and more water went under the bridge, you know, that became a less and less possibility. And then Phil left the band, and... You know, so it's a shame because I'd love to have got back with Mo Red and done a few shows, you know, because really, I mean, they were the best times of my musical career, you know. Yeah. Well, tell us a bit about um, after Motorhead when you started up Fastway. How did that come about? Well, I've come back to London. As I said, I was here kicking my heels. And um, I think the management, the old management felt a little bit guilty because they played a hand in seeing me off, you know. I, I know they, they wanted to make a change in the band anyway, I think, for financial reasons. I don't know why. I don't know what was going on. It was all a bit skullduggery going on. <laughs> we had very poor management, and the publisher was a was a rogue, you know, a crook. Uh, and, um, but they, they contacted me and said, oh, 
Pete Way from UFO has just left UFO. Um, why don't you get together with him? I said, oh, okay. I've never really, I've met Pete, but, you know, only in a drunken state in a bar, you know, oh, man, you know, how's it going, all that. <laughs> but I seem to remember him as a nice guy. And so, so we got together, we had a meeting, and, um, of course, we both liked to drink, which helped. Uh, and so, you know, we talked about it, and we said, well, let's give it a go then. And I said, well, look, I know this guy where we used to rehearse Motorhead in Notting Hill, and I said, why don't we go there and see him and see if he'll... Because I didn't have any money. We didn't have any money. I mean, Motorhead never had any money. I mean, they only paid us a couple of hundred bucks a week. Uh, and Pete didn't have any money because he had a wife and kid, and she got all the money. He didn't have a pot to piss in, as it were. And uh, we went to see this guy anyway, and, I, and as we went into the rehearsal room, Topper Hedden there is from The Clash. I don't really know Topper. Um, and we all got chatting and all that, and I said to the guy at the studio, I said, hey, listen... A new front us a few rehearsals he said yeah no problem and topper said well look, i'll play the drums so the first fast way was really pete way myself and topper heading from the clash on drums it was i'll tell you what it was fantastic we started jamming <laughs> and it was really working you know i mean there was no vocals but we were just just really enjoying playing you know and having a few drinks and uh, just hitting the guitars and just generally making and it was good for me because Playing with Pete was completely different than playing with Lemmy. You know, it was like playing with a, a real bass as opposed to sort of a rhythm bass. Um, it's just a different way of playing. So it gave me a bit of enthusiasm because it was almost like a fresh start. So so it was really all, all going well. It was all great. And then, unfortunately, Tobo had a few problems because um, he really, you know, he, he'd had a real hard time with the Clash and that. And, and after a couple of weeks, he said, look, man, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I can't really do this. He said, I've got issues with the man. So we said, all right, mate, off you go. And that's when we'd heard that Jerry Shirley from Humble Pie was back in England, and he was being he was a decorator. He was painting. I said, we've got to find out where he is. So we, we managed to track him down to a place in Farnborough, just about 20 miles outside London. And we got his phone number. We phoned him up and said, look, can we have a meet? So he said, well, I'm working during the day because he's decorating. You know, He said, but I can meet you in the pub, this pub, in the evening. So we, we drove down there. We got in there, you know, had a drink, and Jerry came in. He was had a bit of paint on him, you know, from where he'd been working. <laughs> and um, we sat down, and, of course, we, we we both admired Jerry a lot, you know, because we both loved Humble Pie, so there was a little bit of worship going on there, you know. <laughs> and um, when we put it to him, that you know, we were putting this band together, and would he like to do the job? He said, well, my drums are in hock, you know. Uh, he said, um, I said, well, look, we can get your drums out. I know someone will lend us some money. We'll do all that. We'll get the drums out and, and we'll give it a go because I was re me and Pete were really up for it, you know. And he agreed. So he threw away his work clothes and got on board, you know. So all we needed then was the singer. So it was all quite exciting, you know. And, and all the time we're doing this, we're doing interviews here because people are saying, "Ah, oh, it's a new supergroup, the first heavy metal supergroup." <laughs> we got Fast Eddie from Motorhead and Pete Way from UFO. You know, and it was kind of like the it was the first sort of heavy metal, you know, out of heavy rock bands that we had here, getting together. Uh, and so every time we did an interview, we'd say to people, you know, if anybody wants to try being a singer, you know, send us your tapes. Uh, we even did some, we did about, ooh, four hours rehearsals testing out singers. We went through about a dozen singers, but no one cut the mustard. Uh, we get, and we used to get carrier bags of tapes every day would come in from singers and drummers. Uh, obviously, we already had Jerry then, but it was still coming in. And um, one of them was, was Dave King from Ireland. And uh, Pete found it first. He said to me, he says, here, look, what about this guy? I said, oh, he looks a bit funny. <laughs> he said, well, put the tape on. So I put the tape on, because Pete had already heard it. And, um, well, it was fantastic. I mean, he had all that Robert Plant-esque stuff that I really liked and Pete liked. Uh, and, um, and he just seemed to have a style of his own as well. And so we, I said, well, I think this is the guy. And Pete said, I oh, know, I think he is too. So we contacted him, and we flew him over to England for a rehearsal. Uh, picked him up at the airport. Fuck me, he looked strange. He had this long red hair, you know, and this big hooter sticking out. And these yellow trousers. And we thought, oh, fucking hell, he looks a bit strange, doesn't he? Uh, but once we got him <laughs> in at the rehearsal room, and he started singing, I mean, it was brilliant. I mean, honestly brilliant. He opened his mouth. Jerry was on drums, and we were just starting to cook from the, from the very first moment. And it was fantastic. I can only tell you, we were just made up. And, um, well, we never looked back from there. We went on. Well, I say we never looked back. We That was the line-up for about three weeks. Um, <laughs> I started writing some tunes with Dave. And uh, the next thing I know, Pete Ways disappeared. And uh, we got to rehearsals one day, and Pete had disappeared. CBS had already said they wanted to sign the album. Uh, they put some money on the table. 
Uh, we'd had a few troubles with Pete's old record company, but Pete was gone. I don't know where he was gone. I mean, I looked around, he was gone, and after a couple of days, I'm starting to worry. I'm thinking, where is Pete? And I'm saying a bit, where's Pete? And this management we took on, which was um, Billy Squire's management, actually, and ELP, Manticore, they finally tracked him down. What had happened was Sharon Osborne had offered him the job in, uh, in Aussie, and Aussie was doing three shows at the Wembley Arena in London, and Pete took the bloody job. I couldn't believe it, but he didn't tell me. He never said nothing to me. He just went off, and, and I didn't see him again. That was 1982. I didn't see Pete again until 1988 when I bumped into him on the street, and that was the next time I saw him. Wow. So you can imagine, that was a bit weird. Yeah, that's... <laughs> I mean, it's, it's starting to sound like, you know, I've got a problem here, and nobody, <laughs> nobody stays with me very long. <laughs> well, I must be, I'm a bit of a taskmaster. I mean, I do, I do like to get things right, and I like things to be right, you know. Um, but I'm not going to defend myself, because, you know, I, I always give 110%, and as far as I'm concerned, that's all you can do, you know. Yeah. But that was that, and then, of course, it was a question of getting another bass player. Well, there wasn't really time... Well, it wasn't actually, there wasn't only time. I was actually hoping that Pete was going to come back. So what Jerry said was, because Jerry knew a few musicians, he knew this um, session bass player called Mickey Feet. He said, well, look, why don't we use Mickey for a, for a few weeks and, and see what happens, you know, and we can finish off the songs and uh, see what happens, and, which we did. And Mickey was great. I mean, great bass player. I mean, really, you know, one of these session guys right on the money, you know, like Stanley Clark was like, you think, fuck me, he's never going to make a mistake, this guy. Um but Pete never returned, never got in touch, nothing. Of course, by then I'm thinking, well, what a, you know, what a fuck that is. I had the right ump, you know, I was really pissed. <laughs> so, so then we moved on. We did the album with with the session bass player, but he made it clear to us that he wasn't gonna, he wasn't gonna um, stay with the band, but he'd gladly do the album. And, and we were we were still hurting, you know, we were hurt by all this thing with Pete, and um, so we weren't ready to take on anybody new. Uh, we did the album. The album came out fantastic. We got Eddie Kramer to do the production. He hadn't worked for a while. He was he was up for some work. It was the first good job he'd had for a long time. So we were all up for it, and it all went very well. And um, and then of course the rest is history. Really, the first album came out. It was a killer. Had some killer tracks on it. And um, and then when we did the British tour, we we hired a, a bass player who had been with the Fall, a guy called Alfie Ages. He was a finger-style bass player, so it didn't really work out. But, you know, we did the shows here. It was okay. Um, and then we got Charlie McCracken from The Taste because the, the tour here didn't go that well. I think there was a bit of animosity from the crowd here that I'd left Motorhead or they perceived that I'd left Motorhead. Nobody really knew what had really happened because there was no real press coverage because they were away in America at the time and I was here and I didn't want to say anything particularly. So, uh, where was I? Oh, yeah, yeah, so... Um, when we, we the tour here, as I say, didn't go that well, um, and I was thinking, oh, we're over, you know. And then we got a call from America saying someone is playing. WMMS in Cleveland was playing our single, and turning it over. The B side was say what you will, and they were going, this is crazy. Everyone was playing it, and suddenly we got this phone call saying, you better get your asses over here, you know, you're making waves here. Hmm. So we did a quick video for Say What You Will, a real quick one. It was done in an afternoon and an evening, and then they edited it together. Next thing I know, we're off to Wyoming to join the uh, Iron Maiden Saxon tour. Well, it don't get much better than that. We tipped <laughs> up at the gig, and all the kids are there going, Eddie, Dave, they'd all been watching the video on MTV, because MTV started that year, 1983. Uh, oh, it was fantastic, man. I'll tell you what, it was a real, real fantastic buzz. That was probably one of, one of my memorable moments, you know, thinking, well... Wow, because Motorhead, of course, never did that well in America. I mean, we did okay in certain certain cities, but but in general, we didn't do that. We weren't really accepted. We were still a little bit early for the for the sort of noise we were making. You know? Yeah. So that's kind of the story up to there. Awesome. I think our our favorite Fastway album is probably the soundtrack for uh, the Trick or Treat movie. Oh, Trick or Treat. Now that was. <laughs> yeah, I do like Trick or Treat. It was a difficult <laughs> one to make though, because after the third album. Um, the third album we did with Dave's band, the Irish band. Um, Jerry left the band, and one thing and another, things got a bit twisted. And um, Dave went back to Ireland and called me over and said, look, do we, do we want to join my band over here? And we'll call it Fastway. Well, I didn't know what to make of that. I was in a bit of a state then, because Jerry had gone. The second album, all fired up, hadn't done that well. So I went over to Ireland. I, I lived in Ireland for a couple of years. Um, 
we did the third album, which was kind of like Dave and his band's baby, you know, with keyboards and stuff like that. And Terry Manning producing it was rubbish, to be honest. <laughs> when I say rubbish, it wasn't rubbish totally, but it was just from where I come from, which is the old three-piece or four-piece rock band, it was starting to get keyboards and Terry Manning put an orchestra on it and I couldn't believe what was happening to me. I'd lost control completely. But then, so that album didn't do any business at all. Uh, so the, basically the band was dying. And, uh, and Dave said, well, look, man, I'm going to go off and do some Irish stuff with these, with my band and um, I don't want to do Fastway anymore. And that's when somebody, uh, my manager turned up and said, look, I've been offered Trick or Treat by the Dilo, Dino De Laurentiis group. Do you fancy the soundtrack? I said, I'd love to, because I've never done a soundtrack. I mean, what a what a challenge, you know. Uh, and Dave said, well, I don't want to do heavy metal anymore. I said, look, Dave, I said, I know you're moving on. I said, but why don't we do this as our swan song? I said, you know, and you could use them a bit of money anyway, which, you know, because we would get a little bit of money for it, not a lot, but enough. And I managed to talk him into it. And he really, he was very reluctant, but he, he agreed in the end. And I have to say, considering the sort of general attitude that was going on between the lot of us, the album turned out really well. But I think a lot of it was down to the fact that, I mean, Charles Martin Smith, the director, was fantastic. I'd speak to him a lot over the phone, and he would tell me exactly what type of song he wanted, and he'd point to the song and say, well, you know that track on this album, the third track, can you do something in that vein? And I'd say, okay, so I'd get the album, and I'd sit down, and I'd, and I'd put something together, and the other guys would come round and they'd put their bit on, and Dave would do his... Dave was very good at putting lyrics on things. Dave was, he was a great lyricist, you know. And, and, you know, it turned out, I mean, things like After Midnight and Trick or Treat itself, I mean, these were great songs, you know. And um, and I, I personally, I thought the movie was quite funny, you know. I quite enjoyed it. Ozzy was in it and, you know, the guy from Kiss was in it. And, um, but then Dave said, well, that's enough for me, I'm gone. So, and funny enough, Trick or Treat was probably our best-selling album in the States. Oh. <laughs> it's funny how it turns out, isn't it? Well, you're... Well, David had enough by then. He didn't want to do heavy rock anymore, and um, so he went off. I mean, David's finally happy now. He's doing that flogging Molly thing, and um, it's an Irish thing, you know, which he's very happy with, you know. <laughs> well, you're with uh, Fastway now. You guys just had a new album out, right? Yeah, it's called Eat Dog Eat, and um, actually, I've got to say something about the cover. The cover, you, I don't know if you've got a copy of it yet, but I'm sure they'll send you one. We've got this, this artist, James Flames. He's an American artist. He does all this heavy metal drawing and stuff like that. He did the cover for us. He's absolutely brilliant. So if you get a chance, have a look at the cover, the back and the front. Yeah, we did the album back at actually the end of 2010. We did so we did a little reunion thing here in 2007, 2008. And that's when I met the singer, Toby Jepson. And um, it all went very well. And uh, Toby and I thought we should write some songs for an album because we were both, you know, we weren't doing much at the time. So just for a bit of fun, we thought we'd write a few tunes. Well, actually... We, we wrote all these tunes. We wrote 11 tunes. We didn't finish them, but we had all the basic framework, and he had his vocal ideas. I had my guitar ideas. Uh, then he had an offer to go to the States on a gig, and because he's got a family and that, he had to stay working, so he took that gig, and then he he took another gig with a band called Gun over here for, for the whole of 2009. Uh, it wasn't until 2010 that I said to him, hey, man, what about this material? Why do you fancy making an album? I said, you know, I'll, I'll pay for the album. You can produce it, and... We'll see how we go, you know. He said, fantastic. So we did it. We finished it. I think it was November 2010. Well, it's taken us till now, this year, to get the record out. I didn't realize that the record business had changed so much, but it's become a, it's become something I don't even recognize anymore, you know. Do you have a tour in the works or any other projects that you're working on? Well, or? we're waiting to see this. I mean, I'm hoping that the album would do well enough to enable us to tour because, I mean, you're probably aware, as I found out, that there is no money available from record companies or publishers anymore for, for rock bands to really do tours. Your tour has to kind of break even now. You know what I mean? There's no sort of yeah. excess funding. Uh, and so the album will have to do okay, and hopefully it will do well enough that the promoters will want to take the risk and put Fastway on. I do think part Fastway's history in America should should enable us to do... A, I mean, I don't expect to make any money, but it would be just great to tour America again one more time, you know. Hit America with my guitar just once more would be great. <laughs> yeah, it sounds awesome. Yeah, it's kind of getting like that because obviously I'm getting on a bit now. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I have to squeeze in as much as I can now before the end, you know. Well, do you uh, have anything you want to leave us with before we let you go? I just want to really say to, to all the American fans over there and audiences in general in America, you're the best audiences in the world. 
and I had my best times playing in America. I had phenomenal time in America. And um, I'd just like to do it one more time. So if I come over with my guitar, come and see us. That's great, man. Beautiful. Yeah. <laughs> I'm five thirty o'clock, and I'm hoping to come over soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's been good talking to you guys. Thanks ever so much for the interview. Oh, thank you. It's been an honor. Oh, thanks very much, guys. I look forward. All right. Let's hope I get over there, and we can meet up and have a drink. All right. Sounds good. All right. All right. You take care, guys. All right. You thanks too. Thanks a lot. You too. Bye. Okay. Cheers. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.